So my project is about tea, and it really has these two sides to it. So one of them is about anthropology, um, or as I like to call it, anthropology. Um, <laughs> and I define anthropology as the study of um, re um, cultural relationships or the study of um, cultural contrasts. Um, and the other side to it is art. And I'll get into what that means later on. I'm going to start. I'm going to start by explaining what tea is. So I define tea as the resulting liquor of pouring hot water over the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant. So um, the Camellia sinensis plant can grow in a lot of different countries and um, can be brewed in a lot of different ways. I'll get to that. But there's additionally um, other types of tea called herbal teas, which are any type of tea that is not made from Camellia sinensis plants um, that is brewed in the same manner. So some popular ones um, include chamomile or mint or ruibos, um, or there are some caffeinated ones, mate, guayusa, and even coffee could be considered a type of tea. Um, and these are, those are more caffeinated, so they're not often considered herbal teas. But I consider them herbal teas for the sake of this project. So the different types of um, Camellia sinensis teas include white, which is made from the buds of Camellia sinensis plants, so the little baby leaves. So they're sweeter and um, more delicate in their flavor. Um, then there's green, which is made from more, um, more mature um, leaves, but they're not that heavily processed. So they're often steamed or um, processed in other ways. The, the way that they are processed is not very easy to, um, easy to find information because the processors like to keep it um, secret-ish. Um, and <laughs> um, you really would have to be more familiar with the equipment and be in China or Japan where it's really done right in order to um, fully understand how it's done. So I'm not going to get into the details of that. But um, the, next step, the next type is yellow, which is light green tea, but it has an extra step in the processing. And this is not one that's easy to come by in America. This is one that is popular in China and other parts of Asia, but um, it's not often exported to America because a lot of the people who produce it feel that it's underappreciated by Americans. And um, it's often miscategorized as green tea when it comes to America. And then there's black tea, which is 100% oxidized, whereas green tea and yellow tea and white tea are all 0% oxidized. So um, it's the most heavily processed type of tea. And it was actually invented in order to help tea um, travel over long distances. So tea, um, green tea was being exported across um, oceans to get from Asia to Europe. And um, that was that was damaging the tea as it as it traveled. It couldn't withstand the um, being at the bottom of a ship. Um, all the damp, um, all the moisture in the air was damaging the leaves. So um, black tea was invented, which can withstand the travel. And then there's oolong tea, which came afterwards because it's in between black tea and green tea, in that it's anywhere from 12 to 80 percent oxidized. So this is usually the art tea. It's the one where the, um, the tea creator, the tea processor, um, really shows their hand and their own, um, their own artistic skill. It has, um, it's very aromatic. And because it has this wide range of 12 to 80% oxidized, it can vary quite a bit. And then there's pu'er tea, which is an aged tea. And it can be either made from green tea or black tea. But it's aged similarly to how cheese is aged. Um, and it's only made in one place in Yunnan, China. And they've been doing it for centuries. And then there's another type of fermented tea called kombucha. But this is um, brewed after the, this is fermented after the tea has been brewed. So that's actually what I gave you all in the clear cups today. That's um, a kombucha that I made myself. Um, yeah. So. My, the question that really sparked my research and sparked my, um, yeah, it's quite an acquired taste. I really like it. <laughs> I really like it. It's really sour. Um, some people <laughs> are not as keen on that, but it, it's um, really healthy. It's really healthy. It can, it's been proven to cure and help um, 
your immune system and cure a lot of diseases. Um, so I really enjoy it. Um, so, but this is matcha tea. So this is a green tea from Japan that's been powdered with a mortar and pestle to make this powder. And what was so interesting to me about this was um, that I had watched this documentary that showed me all about um, green tea ceremonies in Japan. And it showed me, um, this is from the uh, this is from the 19th century, and it's a piece of artwork about a uh, matcha green tea ceremony. And it showed me that people wait all year for these um, ceremonies, and people are gathering around, and they have elaborate costumes, and they're, uh, they're really celebrating this huge event. Um, it takes a long time. It takes the whole day. And they have um, specific equipment for brewing this tea. But in America, the easiest way to get matcha tea is in a Starbucks green tea frappuccino or green tea latte. And I thought that's kind of weird to me um, because if in, in, in Japan, you'll notice that the, um, they're wearing a fancy dress. They're, they have a, a setting that is important as they have like the art in the background is a part of the ceremony. The people brewing, um, brewing the tea have to be licensed even. Whereas a job as a barista, is a no experience necessary position. Um, people can walk into Starbucks wearing anything they want. And it's even in a to-go cup, which is basically the opposite of a ceremony where the location matters. So, um, so I set out to figure out how this happened. Why are we even bothering with this leaf if we're completely changing what it means and changing what it stands for? Um, and the easiest way I found to explain this would be through biochemistry. So. These are two um, macromolecules found in tea. And one of them is caffeine, which I'm sure you've all heard of. It stimulates the central nervous system, and it um, restores alertness, so it wakes you up. And high doses of it can cause anxiety, but in low doses of it, um, it'll just wake you up and make you more alert and speed up your metabolism. And um, then next to it, you'll see L-theanine. And L-theanine is kind of the opposite and it reduces stress and it lowers blood pressure and it relaxes you and it's even an anti-anxiety. So you would think that the two um, cancel each other out. You would think that the caffeine wouldn't be as strong because of the L-theanine or vice versa. But actually what made it so popular to begin with was that the two balanced and the two made it a great beverage for meditation. So when tea was first discovered it was um, it was really popular among Zen Buddhists because they were meditating and they, it would help them to stay awake and focus um, without being too energized and without being too tired or um, too relaxed. So a story that really illustrates this is the story of the Bodhidharma. And it's a myth um, from, um, that's been translated into many different um, types of Buddhism. But it's about the Bodhidharma who went into a cave and he set out to meditate for nine years. And he was going, he was seven years strong. He was in his cave and it was going really well. And seven years in, he just started to notice that he started to get kind of tired. And he started to fall asleep and that was not okay. I mean, seven years in, you can't just let all that go to waste because you're a little tired. So he got really mad at himself and he ripped out his eyelids, he threw them on the ground and where they landed, Camellia sinensis leaves grew. Um, another alternate version of it is that he just um, reached for a nearby leaf and plucked it and ate it, and it was Camellia sinensis leaves, and they helped him. But essentially, it demonstrates that he um, was able to continue the meditation because of the Camellia sinensis leaves, because they helped him to stay awake, but they didn't make him too awake so he could continue the last two years. So when tea became more popular, um, it's, um, it was actually through a different religion. It was through European missionaries who came to China and they saw um, how popular this um, green tea drink was and they, sent, and they wrote back about this popular drink that they'd never heard of before. It was unlike anything they'd ever seen um, in Europe. And, they, um, and, they, and people from Europe started sending in asking for um, this China drink that they didn't know much about. And when it came there, they recognized that the coffee, the caffeine, was similar to what they had in coffee. So they already were drinking coffee and they already had coffee houses in Europe and these were popular and they recognized the caffeine and they realized its similarities and they started to drink 
tea in coffee houses. So starting with the Garraway's Coffee House in London, tea was being served at coffee houses. And over time, they forgot about um, they forgot about the Elthian and they forgot that it stood for all of this um, re rest and relaxation, and that it was about an experience and a moment. And soon they replaced it with other macromolecules. Um, they replaced it with all of the. They found that tea has all of these amazing other benefits and nutrients in it, and it became popular because of those as well. And one thing that um, that they also forgot about, as they forgot that the, um, as they forgot that tea um, stood for meditation, and they forgot that it stood for a moment, and they forgot that it was a form of art, and they forgot that in processing it, a lot of artistic still skill goes into it. And um, so, this man is Okakura Kakuzo, who is from Japan, and he wrote a lot about what tea means in Japan, and he wrote about the moment, the tea moment, and the tea experience that people. Um, have forgotten about as it spread west. And he, um, he describes tea as a religion in aestheticism. So what that really means is that tea is all about a moment and believing in something that's truly, purely aesthetic. It's just about this taste um, that you just enjoy, and you enjoy it in the moment, and you're in it. And it's aesthetic because it's just about how much you enjoy it, and whether or not it's good or bad, or your personal opinions on the taste. But it's also religious because it's you're fully devoted to it and you're fully in the moment and enjoying it. And um, so he, to me, really represents tea's place in Japan, which is still, um, which is still what tea stands for today. Because um, his book is actually not that old; it's only from a uh, little over a hundred years ago. So I wanted to find out what tea stands for in America. And I wanted to find out what really had happened to it. And I found that there's still, tea still is an art. Tea still is aesthetic in America and in Europe. But it's aesthetic in almost the opposite way. This is tea blending. So tea blending is when tea is mixed with other flavors, or um, sometimes fruits, or just other types of teas or herbs. And um, it, can, it can demonstrate a lot of different things. It can be purely for aesthetics, just what tastes well together, as you can see from the pomegranate and raspberry up there. Or it can be to set a mood or set um, a feeling. And as you can see that from the nightly calm um, blend up there. And or it can demonstrate a location such as another country's um, tea traditions, as you can see from the chai up there, which represents India. So um, the reason I chose Twining's Tea Company to show you is because they actually originated um, tea blending in the, 18, in, in the 1870s. So my project where I took this was to prove that tea blending was a legitimate form of art, such as any other form of art. I'm a photographer, I paint, I do ceramics, I'm an artist fully, and I wanted to prove that tea was just as much of an art as any other form of art. And I, um, so I started this by saying, what is something that most forms of art can express, that I want to express through tea. And I chose portraiture, so I chose people. So I defined portraiture as any form of art that depicts a character or a personality. So I started by choosing four models. They're real people who go to this school. Um, and their names were Paulina, Cedric, Tara, and Julie. And um, I chose them based on cultural diversity. So all of them either have dual citizenship or speak another language at home. And I um, and this tied it back to the anthropo anthropology aspect because this showed the um, diverse tea traditions through their um, their their home countries. Um, and I started by interviewing them. And my interviews were basically that I would ask them questions such as, when you think of the time that you spent in Israel, what what smells and tastes come to mind? And they would give me all sorts of fruits and um, plants and sometimes obscure things that they thought wouldn't matter. Like um, Julie told me about the hay in Ireland, and that went into her tea as well. And um, from then, I, 
I interviewed some tea blenders themselves. So I went to a place called Soluna Garden Farm in Winchester, Massachusetts, and they were the most helpful. They allowed me to interview them and ask them all sorts of questions about how they make their blends. And some of the most interesting things that they told me were about um, that you never really know how people are going to respond to the blends because you might think it tastes one way, but somebody else might taste it an entirely different way. An example that they told me was about a tea that they blended that they found they have no idea why, but it really uh, little boys really like it, so they're who never drink tea <laughs> always are going up to them and they'll try the free samples and they'll be like, "Mommy, can we get this?" And all the small, the young boys are just in love with this tea, and they couldn't figure out why. They just n knew that was happening. Um, <laughs> so th she also told me her name was Amy, the person that I spoke to, and she told me that you want to make sure that you select a base blend. And the base blend can either be one type of tea that's the base for your blend, or it can be um, a combination of teas that create one base flavor. And, from, and I asked myself, well, how am I supposed to know what type of tea um, translates into each of these people? Like, how can I just taste something? If I, don't, if I think that this black tea really fits um, Paulina, then how am I supposed to know that other people can also understand that if everybody tastes tea differently? So I set out, so I created something that I called focus groups. And these were when I invited all sorts of people, anybody who would come into the library, into the classroom off the library, and I gave them some tea, and I didn't tell them anything about what it was. And I would ask them questions such as, um, what is the personality of this tea? What season is this tea? What um, images come to mind when you drink the tea? What, um, what would this tea's name be if it were a person, etc. And from then I created, um, from the results, I created composite profiles of each of the teas. So some examples include, um, this is a Dongding Oolong tea. And um, from, from the descriptions that people gave me, I was able to figure out that a, um, a universal image um, of the tea was that it was playing chess in the park and it's one, it's an older man, and it's happy, but it's not an energized guy. It's a nice, a nice description for it that somebody gave me was a mellow sunrise, because it's bright, but it's mellow. Um, it's the smile on an old man's face when he says checkmate. It has notes of happy and notes of sad. So, um, <laughs> so it might be hard to understand how a tea could give somebody this, but um, it wasn't that one person was giving me this and I said that works. It was that one person would say it's happy, one person would say it makes me think of chess, one person would say um, it reminds me of the park. And from that I would be able to create um, this whole profile where it all goes together. So another example, um, Sencho Green Tea gave people the idea of a serial killer um, from Japan. <laughs> and. Um, they described it as a man who lives by the ocean. I thought maybe the tea isn't a person, but maybe is the tea is the place where he keeps the dead bodies. And um, I, I chose all of the descriptions of it that kind of um, from various people that all kind of could go into it. So a lot of people spoke about the ocean, but only one person said that this tea was a software engineer. But I thought it went well with the personality. Um, <laughs> Not that all software engineers are serial killers. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that it I like could be. The next one is a Chunmi green tea. Um, and I describe this as an existential gardener, a woman who is depressed and miserable and vapid, and she gardens to save herself. And it's over the top and insane how obsessed with gardening she is, but she just can't bear the thought of not gardening. It would mean that her life is too empty, and it would force her to realize that she's going to die. So she continues, no matter how hot it is, no matter how dirty it gets, how cold it is, how painful, because the only way that she will ever bring life into the world is through her garden. And perhaps it has something to do with fertility, as she has no children or family. She might be lonely, but who really knows? And I actually wrote um, a full, uh, fuller, um, expanded version of this um, description, a whole portrait of her, which I, um, will be featured in the spring's issue of Thought Prince magazine. So you can read it there. Um, and from there, I took all of the profiles of the teas. I had about 20 total. And I, 
Um, and I looked at them and I thought, well, which ones can kind of fit the people that I've interviewed? And for some of them, it was about the place that they told me about, um, th that that went with the description I had of the tea. And for some of them, it was just that I knew these people and they kind of fit the tea. So I'll start with Cedric. So Cedric is from Uganda. And he told me a lot about um, growing up in Uganda and that it reminded him, and that when he thought of it, he thought of fresh fruits and um, and fresh, clean dirt and um, earth, and he thought of organics. And um, so I took that and um, I, I looked at some tea descriptions that I had. And I, this is made from a base of Yunnan black tea, Formosa oolong tea, and Ruibos herbal tea. And the Yunnan description was about looking at the spring with nostalgia. So it was a person looking at their garden or looking at the, um, the way that the spring had come and um, they were nostalgic about it. And I thought that fit Cedric pretty well because he was looking at a place that was earthy and blossoming and organic, but he was looking at it from af after moving on. And then uh, the Formosa came from a description that fit um, the end of a camping or a hiking trip. So people described it as earthy, but it also had this tiredness to it, like it was ready to go home. And the Ruibos people described kind of as an all-American kind of person, and the people described it as materialistic, people described it as um, fun and energized, and those all kind of fit the way that he described himself um, and the way that he described America. So those three made the base. But then I also flavored it with pineapple, ginger, baby banana, passion fruit, cinnamon, and clove based on what he told me about his tea traditions growing up and um, just his favorite fruits and things. The next one is Julie. And this is a puer tea, a black puer tea, which people described as a reliable friend who's there when you're down. They described it as shy and somebody who you need to get to know more. But they also described it in a way that fit her descriptions of Ireland. So she described Ireland as damp, dull, dirty, and calm and boring. And people also described <laughs> um, the puer tea that way. No offense to Irish people, that was just her experience. Um, and then I also flavored it with, two diff with three different types of cinnamon and vanilla beans. And so I was going for a cinnamon bun type of feeling to it because she told me about growing up, her mom used to make cinnamon buns. Um, and she also drinks tea with milk and sugar all the time. So I designed this to be a type of tea that would take milk and sugar well. The next one is my most complicated tea. Um, it was for Paulina, and it makes sense that it's the most complicated because she's from a whole lot of different countries. She speaks like eight languages or something. Um, and it, um, she told me mostly about Ukraine, Russia, and Israel. Um, so she, um, so the base is made from Lapsong Soshong, which is a smoked black tea. And the way that people had described that tea was that it was a mischievous kid and other, it, it was a polarized kind of um, um, descriptions of it. And so I took it to be two characters. It was a mischievous little kid and his older, calm, but fun grandmother. And the two of them had this like nice relationship where she, where he's mischievous and causing trouble, and she's friendly and nice, and she's um, having fun with him, but she's also his grandmother and taking care of him. So um, I thought that fit her because it has this feminine aspect to it, but it also has this um, troublemaker aspect to it, which kind of fits her in my experience um, as her friend. Um, and then <laughs> Gunpowder Green Tea also told people about this um, teenage girl, and they described it as feminine, but also it had this, um, this spunk, this punch to it. Um, so those two kind of created this feminine, but also kind of devilish character. Um, and then I flavored it with jasmine, rose hips, and roses to give it this floral aspect to it. She's a very um, fashionable person. She's very into fashion. And I wanted to make sure that this tea actually aesthetically seemed um, like her from looking at it, um, so visually fit her. And I think it does because it has this, um, this darkness, but it also has this spunk to it. It has like a pop of color. I think it's my prettiest tea. It's also the one that you all have in front of you. Um, the hot one in the white cup. So I, um, I then flavored it with stevia and grapes and buckwheat as well. Um, so the buckwheat comes from her past growing up and the grapes come from Israel, um, how she described Israel. 
and the stevia just made it sweeter. She told me that she doesn't like to sweeten her tea, but she doesn't mind if her tea is sweet, so it's a pre-sweetened tea. Um, and the next one, and the last one, is Tara. And this was the most stressful tea to make because I really learned, I mean, even though the Amy from So Luna Garden Farm had told me that everyone will taste tea differently, Tara tasted tea almost the opposite way that I did. And it was incredibly frustrating working with her. And if she wasn't already my friend, I don't know how it would have gone out because every, every other day, I was giving her a new bag of tea and I was, how, how does this one taste? How does this one taste? And um, I think I went through about eight or nine with her and about um, maybe 12 or so just with myself. Um, and so I eventually realized that this one was an exception to the rule about creating a base tea. There was no base tea because I wanted to give her a white tea, but when I gave her the white tea, she told me that she could not taste anything. And I then tried to give her a, um, a rooibos tea, and she liked it, but it just wasn't there yet. So we went with um, a fruity tea, because she told me she is from um, a lot of different countries. She has four citizenships. She's, um, she told me about Italy. She told me about Trinidad and Tobago. She told me about France, um, Great Britain, England, and America. So. Um, the, so this is flavored with mint and hibiscus leaves because the mint um, was what, something that she drank. She drank mint tea often when she was in France and she drank hibiscus tea as well in Egypt. She called it carcaday. Um, and she also told me that she's really interested in fruity flavors and she told me that when she thought back to um, the time she spent in Trinidad, she thought about the first time that she had trick cereal. So she thought of really sweet fruity flavors that don't really taste like fruit but have this like fruity feeling to them. So this is a tea that takes a lot of sugar and it's really fruity but it also has this um, extra mint and hibiscus flavor to it as well. Um, so that's all for my, um, for my presentation but I want to give you guys a chance to smell the teas. So if you come up here I will give you a smell. Okay, hold on, hold on. I need to brush it to you. There it is. Okay. There is a method to smelling teas because if you stick your face in it, you're gonna just like choke on the cinnamon, or you won't get the right um, balance of it. So here is Tara tea. Tell me if you can't smell it. Or oh, you can smell that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on up. Everyone. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, that's <laughs> and um, this is Julie tea. This is by far the most, this is Julie, it's by far the most popular mm -hmm. smell wise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Is she the cinnamon bun? Girl? Cinnamon bun? Yeah. 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 Ooh. Who's this? Who's this? Oh, this is Cedric. Oh. He's from Uganda, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm very, yeah. yeah. I can smell Uganda. Yeah. No, I've never been to yeah. Uganda. Yeah. Kind of an yeah, earthiness? Or? Yeah. Yeah. No, it smells very, it smells it's very, very different from the other two. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the smells are so evocative. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. And you've all been drinking this, but I can still give you a smell of it. <laughs> yep, we've been drinking. <laughs> A lot less um, of a, an aroma than yeah. the other three. Oh, also the kombucha that I gave you was made from Cedric tea. Mm. More familiar. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> um, so that's my project. <laughs> that was Paulina. <laughs> That's my favorite. So what? We do have time for Q and A. So yeah. What drew you to teas in the first place? So okay. Because you started off with what tea is, but what 
was TT, like how did you come up with this idea? Or so I've been I've been drinking tea since I was a kid. I can't remember when I started or how it started, but um, I was really um, in, I was more into interested in tea than the rest of my family um, or anybody else that I knew. I think because. Um, because it was a way to aestheticize taste and smell, and I found that really interesting. And um, I, I was just drawn to it. I wanted to get to enjoy taste and smell without having to think about nutrition or think about um, how this would factor into um, my like calories for the day, or it wouldn't be too filling, it wouldn't be part of a meal. I could have as much of it as I want. Um, so that was how I first got interested in tea, but for my project, I came up with, I saw all of these presentations last year and I wanted to do all of their projects, but I couldn't do that because they'd just done them. <laughs> so I came up with some criteria for myself for deciding what my project would be. And I said that it has to be, the, first and foremost, it had to be useless. It had to be something that would not translate directly into um, something that I was studying in college or something that I would do with the rest of my life because if it did then I would feel as though I had wasted an opportunity to do something else it's in there in um, because it's my senior year project it is productive because it's helping me graduate so I wanted to take advantage of that and do something that wouldn't really um, that wasn't something I should be doing anyways I thought about a lot of ideas that were all um, in the field of like social activism, but I thought if it's such a good idea, then I should probably just do it. I shouldn't need the school's motivation to do that. And um, I also said that I wanted it to be something where I could still use my knowledge from um, all of the different areas that I'm interested in. So this tied together anthropology, it tied together sociology, art, um, biology, botany, chemistry. I like I was growing my own mint. Um, I was. Um, learning a lot about how plants work and so it had all of that to it as well and nutritional and health studies um, were a huge part of it as well so I was just drinking tea and I thought this is perfect I'll do this for my project and that was it <laughs> yes. so what surprised you the most during this process so during the process I, I had a really open mind, I have to say. I wasn't easily surprised by anything that came out of the focus groups. Um, even the serial killer, I was like, I knew one of them would be really weird. Um, <laughs> I, I think I was most surprised by what happened with Tara that I explained, that I was giving her teas and she was just not tasting them, or she was telling me there was too much mint, and then I would taste it and be like, there, there's only a little bit of mint. Or um, there was one time she, she gave me a list of, I, I would ask the people questions when I gave them the teas and the models. Um, and one of them was guess the ingredients. And I was always really surprised by the ingredients that they guessed. Um, even Paulina surprised me. She loved her tea at first, um, at first taste. So I only had to add a few ingredients from first draft to second draft, which was my final draft. But, um, but um, Paulina was like, it smells like cinnamon. And I was like, there is no cinnamon. I don't know what you're smelling. And Tara was really, it was really um, just stressful for me that I was giving her tea. And she was just not tasting the same thing I was. And I just couldn't figure that out. So that was the most surprising to me. So I'm really interested in this connection between the, the way that tea is consumed and the culture. You know, you talked about how in Japan and China it's this very slow process, and then we had Starbucks. I wonder if you came across any information about how that has changed in mm -hmm. Asia over time as sort of society has become faster and more like European society. It has um, changed in that they are also enjoying tea. Um, from what I know, having not traveled to Japan or China, so from what I've read, um, it has um, changed in that they have adapted some of our culture, but they haven't lost theirs. So it's still there that they'll um, that they'll have tea ceremonies. Um, I'm very sure of that that they're still practicing that, but they are also having tea. They also have tea bags, which are um, a European thing, a way to speed up the process. Um, and they also have iced tea. And even um, an example, um, Taiwan is known for bubble tea, boba tea, um, which is um, really surprising to me because it's right 
off the coast of China. China thinks Taiwan is part of it. So there's that whole thing that it should have similar tea traditions to China. But in actuality, they, they're drinking this iced on the go drink that's um, very much against the idea of purity because it has milk and sugar and um, tapioca pearls in it. Um, so it has changed, but it's still held on to its original traditions, would be my answer. Sort of going along with that, but my question was about um, the role of context. Um, I mean, because you know, it seems like so important, some of the rituals and the ceremonies and things that go around with tea, but so can, can you talk a little bit about the different experiences that people have based on where they're drinking the tea? I mean, if they're drinking it in a Starbucks or if they're drinking it in, a, in an elaborate ceremony or a meditation ceremony? Or so um, I spoke a lot about this a little bit with um, Okakuro Kakuzo, who talked about the tea, um, the, the idea of religion and aestheticism. So it's all about that you're fully committed to um, to just the sense of the senses of smell and taste. That you're fully in the moment, and it's really a religious um, experience. It can be enjoyed by anyone of any religion, but it's um, it it can be truly a transcendent experience. It can be it can mean a lot more to a person if they're fully in the moment and understanding it, and it can be meditative as well. So. Um, Drinking it in America, drinking it in a to-go cup, you're not going to have that same experience of being fully committed to it. You're not going to appreciate it as much, and you're not going to understand all of the subtleties in the flavor, um, which is in part because of how we're drinking it, but also because it's not grown here, so it's being shipped from far away, and it's losing some of its, um, its uh, fine taste to it. It's also um, a, a cultural and societal difference in that if I, um, if I were to sit and drink a cup of tea and say that it was high art and say that I was um, truly um, experiencing this fine, um, prestigious thing that was transcendent, I would probably get laughed at because, <laughs> because that's just not what it means here. So it's also just a um, in the mentality of Americans. It's a different thing. I was struck by the truly multidisciplinary nature of your project. I mean, when you were listing the amount, you usually talk about interdisciplinary, you know, wow, it's English and history, you know, but you kind of took all of it to another level. So I'm just interested in how, how that's, as you think about your own future in education, what you want to study and your passions, how this kind of project has influenced that. Well. I applied for a job as a barista, so that's, <laughs> but I think I'm honestly, I think I'm a more, I, I always thought of myself as a really open-minded artist, and I think I'm way more open-minded now. Um, one of the quotes that I had read at the beginning of this, and I actually put it on my um, portfolio, and it's um, been driving this a lot, was um, it's by Dwayne Michaels, um, trust the voice in your head that says why not, and then do it. And I think I always, I always thought, like, why not paint this way? But now I understand that anything can be a medium. And I, um, I, it's opened my mind to all sorts of different arts that I had never even thought of. Um, yeah. And then additionally, it's helped me. Um, I'm interested in going into public health after college. So it's, um, I've studied a lot about um, cultural relative health um, in order to understand this. Um, I read a book called The Green Tea Book that talks about, um, it talked about this paradox between Japan and America where we're not eating significantly that much worse than them, but we have that much more cancer than them and that much more um, health um, issues than Japan has. And this is easily tied to tea. And I actually said at the beginning of my research that um, I went through a lot of different phases of deciding what was going to be the focus of my essay before I landed on anthropology. And one of them was that I was going to study how tea relates and demonstrates the cultural um, dis um, disparities between health. So how, so how it demonstrates that one country might be healthier than another because of tea or um, or they're drinking more tea because of their health differences or how those two are connected. Yes. So there's a movement afoot these days to support um, fair trade. Yes. Teas. 
do you notice that they have a different flavor along with their different ethic? Does it, how, how does the fair trade movement impact tea? So the fair trade movement is very, is very linked to tea. I wrote about it a lot in my essay. Um, I, um, I don't know if it totally influences the flavor because I have never had the opportunity to taste a green tea that was fair trade and a green tea that wasn't side by side. Um, but I, I know organics does change a lot of, um, of the flavor. Um, I can't taste the difference myself, but a lot of people who are, um, a lot of tea experts and people who enjoy tea as high art can taste the differences in organic move in the organic movement. Um, but it does influence a lot in where people are getting the tea from. So that um, so for example, there are three main types of black tea: um, Assam, Java, and Ceylon. And these all taste very different. They're um, very distinctly just different types of teas. And there's also Chinese tea, which is um, usually also Assam tea, but it tastes different from other types of Assam teas. So um, if a person is trying to get a fair trade tea, they might change where they're getting the tea from. And um, Assam, Java, and Ceylon are all different places. Um, so these are, they all taste very different from each other because of where they're from and because of the size of the leaves grows different. And um, location is everything in tea growing. So that would be one influence on it. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Wow.